For, first, I should tell you that I, I, because of different circumstances, I grew up in three New York State institutions. You know, I went in at the age of five, and I came out um, at the age of 21. And um, uh, I, uh, and the reason for that is because back in the 60s when I was born, you know, they didn't have a lot of supports for families who had sons or daughters with uh, various um, disabilities or, or challenges, as you might say. And um, because um, my mom, my mom ended up having a having a nervous breakdown. So, you know, because her and my dad, they tried to, you know, because I was born in Massachusetts. And then um, my dad was an over-the-road truck driver. So, you know, with that, you know, you have to move all over the place where there's work. And um, so within the state of Massachusetts and also New York, once my mom found out that I had cerebral palsy, um, she, like any other parent, would go and try to get services for to keep their children at home. Well, back then they didn't have that stuff, so she was trying to to do that stuff for herself because my dad wasn't around a lot because he was on the road. And not only that, but she had three other children that she was raising and working a full-time job. So to make that long story short, uh, she, at the end of the fourth year, we began to see a very significant change in um, her her body language, uh, the way she was responding to stuff. And we knew that we didn't really know what it was, but we knew something was really not right. And and she she ended up having a nervous breakdown. So therefore. Um, the judge and the doctor at that time, uh, you know, <clears throat> they said that she was unfit, so they signed me over to state. And I want to tell you, Jerry, at when I walked into the first institutions that I was, because I was in three of them throughout New York State, um, the first one was down in New York City. It, it was it was called. West Haverstar. Now it's called Helen Hayes, and it's a it's a building for for people with autism now. Um, but back then, you know, like my mom, um, people with who other parents who had people with disabilities were told the same thing: put them in an institution because they're gonna die anyway within a year and. You know, so the parents did that, and then a lot of them never, never returned again. So, because that's what the doctor always told people. Well, um, when I went in there, I want to tell you, I grew up from a five-year-old boy into a man in a hurry. That, that was not some place I wanted to be. It was the the first one was all three of them were dingy and dark and smelly and, and, and just not nice places. But um, I knew that after 15 minutes of being in one of these places, I didn't want to be here. But back then, you know, once you're signed over to the state, I don't know if you know, but um, you, once you were signed over to the state, you were a ward of the state. So that's where my self-advocacy journey began um, because I lived on a unit with 20 people at a time usually, and they were they were nonverbals, and I was the only verbal one that there that there was on each, because I've been shifting around from New York City to Rome State School to uh, Syracuse, and each each of the places I went to, um, I lived on a unit of 20 people at a time. Um, 
and the system was not ready for someone who was uh, verbal and who was able to start to speak up about, you know, uh, what the kidneys, what the conditions were. They didn't like it so much that um, I was um, very abused in, in all of these institutions, um, verbally and mentally and also physically in a lot of cases. Um, so uh, there took my journey to do some advocacy. And, and you gotta you gotta understand that all through this process, People would tell me that I would never be where I am today. I, I'd always be stuck in a state institution. And my my opinion of that is um is um my opinion is well you have the right to say it. you know you have the right to f say and feel what you want to but what you say and what I do is two different things and and. See, the system back then, they, they did abuse stuff and things just to break you down, you know, just to, just to make it crack, so to speak. And, I, and I, I just, in my mind and in my soul, I just sort of, um, I figured that out. And I just said, no matter how hard it's going to be, then I'm going to, um, I'm going to fight it. And I'll give you some examples of what I was talking about with, see, most of the people I w live with, like I told you before, were not verbal. They didn't have any way of communicating at all, you know, because they didn't have, uh, you know, they didn't have pathfinders and they didn't have um, voice boxes for people to type in and speak. Um, so... Whenever I saw somebody get abused, I said, well, you know, I, I can't stand this because my mom always told me, she said, look, we can't be with you in body, but we can be with you in spirit. And two, th and th two things she said to me that always stuck in my mind. She goes, when you know you are wrong, admit you're wrong. When you know you're right, admit you're right. And don't ever let anybody walk on you because if you if you do that you're you're basically done. So I went into these places knowing this, and when I, and basically back when I was in institutions, you 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 didn't have to you didn't have to fight for for special things. You fought just to stay alive. And I, I thought to myself, well, you know, I need to. I, I was doing advocacy before I even knew what the word was. And basically, back then, the advocacy was just to stay alive, basically. You know, it wasn't like, you know, uh, it wasn't like it is today where you made positive inroads and, and made a lot of changes. And I said to myself, um, if I was going to help anybody make anything better for better for their life or my own, I had to get out from the state system. So I kept, I, you know, every day I would go down to the directors and say, look, I want to get out of here. I need to get out of here. This isn't the place for me. And and I, I told them about, about, a lot about what the abuse was, and they, and they, um, and they, you know, they, that there's a lot of them that didn't believe it, but you know, and and you know, and they thought I was lying and stuff. So when I did that, I began to get punished severely. Um, whether it would be um, getting beat up when he got back to the unit, I, I'll tell you something, Jerry. When I went in the institution, I was I was walking. And as you see now, I'm not walking, and the reason why I'm not walking is because I was held down by two staff, and I was hit in the back with a lead pipe just because I was defending someone who was getting beat up. And, and their comment was, oh, you want to go and start trouble, so we're, we're going to fix you. And so, so that's where some of the abuse took place. 
And I said, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna do, but I have to be strong, and I gotta get out of here. So, I began my quest to to um, go talk to the directors and really tell what was going on, and um, I eventually left three New York State institutions. From there, I went to um, ICF, which is an intermediate care facility for, excuse me, for people with disabilities. Um, I lived there for um, six years. Then from there, I, I went to family care. Um, and one of my, the family care provider was one of the guys that worked with me in the ICF. And he was only my family care provider on paper. You know, he he didn't, you know, he wasn't in charge of any of my life. It was just, uh, it was him and, him and his roommate, but just on paper, just to do that. Because when they first approached the family care uh, thing with me, I was, I didn't warm up to it at first because I didn't want, I didn't want, I didn't want it to be controlled and all that stuff. So I said, in order for me to do this, th these are going to be the ground rules. And the ground rules is that I'm I'm not going to be told what to do all the time. I'm not going to be told, oh, you gotta you gotta uh, get a receipt for all your money you use, yeah, you know, and just. Just a lot of the rules and regs that a lot of the state systems have, and I said, if that's the case, then I'm not going to do that. Well, they didn't do that, so I, I, I lived in family care for I, I had lived in family care for about five and a half years. Then I left there. I moved into um, after I, after I went, I left family care. I. My de my roommates and I decided, and this is when I was working at the Center of Human Policy, I decided I was going to take a leave of absence because I was sort of getting burnt out, you know, because you know, you know how that is. You've been in a job so long, and after a while, you just you need a break and just a regroup. Um, so we, I always wanted to move down south. So I moved down south, and... Um, because my roommates had family members down there, and they told us, "Oh yeah, come down. You you know we got jobs and all this stuff in the aid service and all that." Because I have the aid service and everything that I do. Um, so we went down there. We lived down there for seven months, and there was nothing down there as far as advocacy work and aid service was very slim to none. So. Um, my dad took sick while I was down south. He had emphysema really bad at the beginning stages. So I left everything and I came back. Well, when I came back, I moved up north where they are. They live up um, Tupper Lake area, which is way, way up north. It's, it's about a half hour from the Canadian border. Um, so I I moved up there, and then once he got stable, um, uh, I tried to get work up there, and then it wasn't happening. The aid service was very slim, and 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 when I left the center on that little that when that little leave there, Steve said Steve Taylor said, "Well, your job will be here, you know, if you want it when you come back, because." He said, we can't find it. There there would be nobody to replace you. So, so you know, once my dad got settled down and stuff, um, he, he I uh, moved back and then, and then, um, and then uh, I got my job back and then, and then, um, my roommates that I was living with, they had they they had went through some changes. I moved back in with them for about a week. I couldn't stand what was going on, so I moved out of there and I moved into my own apartment. 
with aid service. I lived on my own um, basically since 88. Um, and then from there, um, my wife was doing one of three internships at the Center on Human Policy um, for her, you know, for her job. And um, I wasn't there when she was doing that at first, when she was doing the internship. I came back for a 25th um, reunion that the center was having, and um, she was there, and we just started talking, and um, we found out that we had a lot of stuff in common, and because um, she had cerebral palsy and too, and she was adopted and stuff, and um, and then. Uh, we dated for two and a half years, and uh, we just, this last August, we had our 15th wedding anniversary. Um, and, um, and all through our journeys, we've also owned a house. Um, we since uh, sold the house um, because the area got bad, um, and... Um, we, not only did we own the house, but we were landlords, too, because we rented out the top floor of the house, and then, um, so we sold the house, and now we live in the suburbs, like I, like I had mentioned to you, um, but with that, with that said, I, I have to have aid service in everything that I do, except for driving my wheelchair and feeding myself. So without my aid service, I couldn't, I couldn't do any of this stuff because I need them to help me get up, get dressed, get, you know, to take, uh, do all my hygiene and stuff. But I say that to, to say this. Here is a system that told me I would never, ever do to the extent that i and and I I think I was one of the one of the very not the very first but one of the very first people who lived in the state system who got out from under it and even though needed support still to live independent I think I'm one of the first ones that uh, decided to challenge the system and get married because when my wife and I were talking about this, we went down to our local um, social security office and they told us, well, you know, if you just live together and stuff, you'll be able to keep all your benefits, benefits and stuff. And I looked at the guy and I said, I said, I need to ask you a question. I said, are you married? Yeah. Are you happy? Yeah. Well, guess what? We're going to do that too. And he goes, well, if you do that, you're going to be losing all your all your supports. And I said, you know what? I said, then I'm going to have to take that chance. And, and yes, we face this stuff every day. I mean, every year we, you know, because you got to recertify for Medicaid and so Social Social Security is every five years. But I say that to say all this. I guess I've always been one that, you know, you know, I've always believed that it could happen. If you wanted it to happen, it could happen. And yes, you're going to hit roadblocks. You're going to hit a system where they're going to fight against you. But that's what self-advocacy has done. Self-advocacy has opened the door and because I've always been um, self-determined, but the thing is, is that I never really understood the 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 importance of self-advocacy until I until I started working in it because I actually I actually started in self-advocacy by volunteering. I went into my job right out of high school. I graduated in 82, and I went right in working with the center 
in 83 right out of school. So this is the only job I've ever had, you know, so. You're going to run up and get some roadblocks, you know, because you're going to probably have a system that will probably tell you tell you that, um, you know, it takes a lot of work to live on your own and, and stuff. And um and you might get some you might get some people that would be willing to help you, but you might even run against the people who will not support you in that. But you know what the biggest barrier is is attitudinal, attitudinal barriers. I think I mean there's tons of barriers out there, but attitudinal barriers are the the um the biggest I think. And now we got this new thing called it's it's been out uh about I uh, I don't know, about five, six years now, self determination. So what this does is it this program will allow you to um take take the money that you're allotted by OMRDD or any state facility that you could take your pot of money that you get for your services and you could design it the way you want it to be designed. So so that that's a new that's a new concept. And with that you have to have a circle of support that you you know, people that you choose that you trust and and what they do is they teach you that the maybe to start off with they teach you the basic stuff that you need to become independent like say um say for example well they could say well so and so can't live on his or her own because they don't know how to cook or they don't know how to budget money and stuff like that. Your your circle of support and the people that you trust um can help you and set it up so that you're able to teach. You know, so that you're able to not only teach but you're able to learn. And and the the good thing about self determination is is that you can use any number of learning mechanisms that it's gonna help you achieve your goals. The thing about self-determination is in order to get it funded, you know, it's gotta, you gotta show that you're, you're gonna be able to, to progress, I mean, you know, to enhance your life. That's, that's one of the main goals of that. And which is good because it gives you a a um, sort of a guideline or uh, a, a thing to shoot for. Um, is it is it tedious as far as paperwork and rules and regulations? Yes, but it's not as bad as because you have the control to and and if you don't like a particular agency that you're working with, you can talk to the people that are helping you with your, like with your circle of support and your self-determination. You can switch it to another agency, you see? So, and nowadays there's a lot more opportunities for people to learn and grow. And, and, and it's been proven that people can do it too. I mean, people, People have proven that, and and it gives them such, it gives them such a, 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 a sense of respect and and dignity because they can say, look, look, I I did this, and people tell me I couldn't do this, and, and look at me, and, and people tell me that you know. They believe in me, and I, and they're telling me I need to believe in myself and who I am as a person and stuff like that. So.